First, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, obviously, because uh, it was uh, they took so much effort to make this conference possible. So, and it's a pleasure for me to be here in this wonderful place. And so, uh, what I'm going to do is to report on some recent uh, results uh, that has been done in collaboration with uh, Aitor Balmaceda, who is here sitting in the audience, and David de Negro. And well, for the most of the talk, I will skip almost all the details. I, We'll try to make this accessible to everyone. And so first, I'm going to introduce what is the problem of quantum control. And then I will introduce the quantum grass and magnetic Laplacians, in particular, those that we are going to be interested in. And the reason why we choose these uh, models is because they are general enough to uh, uh, um, so that we can uh, define the problem of the boundary control problem in, that we are interested in, which I'm going to speak in a minute about it. But also it's very close to possible applications regarding the technological applications of, uh, of uh, quantum technologies that are currently being developed. And finally, I will just state the results on controllability that uh, we were able to pull out of these models. So the problem of quantum control can be stated in a very simple way, considering that we have uh, as Rodier equation uh, like this one, where this uh, H0 is just one uh, Hamiltonian, it's normally called the free Hamiltonian, it's the uncontrolled dynamics of the system. And then at the disposal of the experimenter, one has one field that can apply on the system. And the strength of the field is modulated by this time dependent function U of t. So you can select the strength of the field. And the objective is, okay, you uh, want to start at some uh, initial state, psi zero, at a time t zero. And what you want to do is to reach some other target state that you choose at a final time capital T, okay? So the problem of the controllability, which is what we are going to uh, uh, address today, is does it exist such a function UDT does, that does this trick? So in a sense, if UT S or UTT0 is the unitary propagator that solves the Schrodinger equation, and phi of t is uh, just the evolution under this unitary propagator of the initial state, if uh, uh, at time capital T, you are reaching the target state. That is what we want to address. We want to decide if this function exists. Well, obviously, already one can say in, in the finite dimensional case, is these Hamiltonians are, uh, first of if they commute, H0 with H1, and the initial state is an eigenvalue of these uh, uh, two commuting Hamiltonians, obviously this function will not exist because you will not be able to leave out uh, the proper space of the system, okay? So it is clear that some conditions have to be chosen between these two Hamiltonians. Now, um, let's say at the finite dimensional level in, in, in quantum control, the Classic theory of control has been applied successfully. So classically means that they solve essentially um, ordinary differential equations. So it's always for quant finite dimensional quantum systems. And a proof of the success of these uh, techniques is that the, um, the development of the recent quantum technologies has been also very successful. You know, last year, for instance, Google already showed that they have built their quantum computer and they proved some benchmark about uh, with it, okay? So this is very real. All that has been done using the classical theory of control, so it's finite dimensional. Uh, but just doing this has uh, some obvious limitations. For instance, uh, in particular, all the models that are used to deploy these uh, quantum technologies are infinite dimensional in nature, okay? The only thing is they do not know how to handle the quantum control problem in truly infinite dimensions, so what they do is they truncate the system to a certain level, to the number of dimensions that they need to codify the information and apply their, uh, uh, the classical theory. But this comes with some uh, uh, problems because this truncation introduces some errors, okay? And they have to fight to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, control these uh, uh, errors that they introduce because they consider the system to be finite dimensional, okay? Uh, 
So now if you want to go to the infinite dimensional case, one problem is that these uh, finite dimensional results cannot be applied directly to the infinite dimensional case. So one could think that, okay, if I manage to select some finite dimensional subspace and solve the problem there, I will then just let the dimension grow and check the convergence and everything should work. The problem is that this is uh, tremendously hard. And one of the reasons for this is because in the finite dimensions, the Schrodinger equation does always have a solution because the operators are bounded. But in infinite dimensions, in particular, you have unbounded operators, even the existence of solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation is compromised. For instance, right, the uh, unbounded operators are not even continuous. So even if the equation is uh, first order and linear, existence of solutions is uh, quite a big deal. And uh, uh, moreover, just the simple notion of controllability that I introduced, so starting from one single state, and reaching one final state is not even appropriate in infinite dimensions, okay? One can, there are no-go theorems that tell that this uh, simple statement is not possible. So the first thing that one has to do is the, to select an appropriate notion of controllability in infinite dimension, which is the approximate controllability. In the sense, I'm not going to aim to reach exactly my target state in a finite time, but I just will to reach some neighborhood of that target state up to any epsilon, okay? If I'm able to, for every epsilon, find an evolution of the Schrodinger equation for a finite time t, such that I'm reaching this epsilon neighborhood of the target state, that's what I'm going to call approximate controllability, and that's what we are trying to aim for in these models. So, but if going to infinite dimensions is so difficult, and we have already seen that the finite dimensional way of working did work so well. Why, are, why do we want to go actually to infinite dimensions? Well, the reason is um, that uh, these truncation errors that they get, they are really uh, difficult to handle. And for instance, what they do to fight against these errors is, okay, I'm going to finite dimensions. Then they consider that the system is slightly bigger, so has more dimensions that they, actually that they need, and they use the extra dimensions to control the error and correct the evolution of the system. Well, if you go directly to infinite dimensions and solve the problem there, you are going to build in all this error correction in the model by hand, not by hand. Uh, um, this is going to build in in the model. You don't need to input these extra errors. Uh, at the end. And also, this is what we like the most, is that it opens a, a new type of controllability problem that's ha that has not been considered before, which is the boundary control. As you know, if the operators are unbounded, we have to fix some uh, self-adjoint conditions. I'm sorry, but my talk is also going to be self-adjoint. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, this is an exciting idea, because if you selects one self adjoint extensions or some family of self adjoint extensions, just by modifying the boundary parameters, you can also aim to control the system without the need of introducing any external field on the system, which in principle will avoid other possible sources of error because the control is going to be less invasive on the system. At least that's what we hope for when we're considering these things. Uh, and one other good reason to Take this, and this is more related with uh, the models that we are going to discuss later, that is the quantum graphs, is that uh, in one of the applications of quantum control that they are using, which is called superconducting circuits, one of the key elements in this process, which are called Josephson junctions, can actually be modeled like point-like interactions. The point is that they cannot use this modeling of the Josephson junction to try to solve the control uh, problem or address it just because there is not enough uh, uh, of the theory of con the control theory of infinite dimensions is still to be developed, let's say. The efforts in this direction started 10, 15 years ago. Okay, so let's go now to the second part of the talk. And to introduce the, uh, the models that I'm going to use, let's start and keep the things very simple. So suppose that we have just some interval, 0p, 0,2p, and I'm going to consider as an operator, the uncontrolled dynamics is going to be this uh, just Laplacian operator on the interval. And I'm going to consider this so-called uh, 
uh, quasi-periodic boundary conditions. So they're not periodic. I'm just going to assume that there is some phase that relates the value of the uh, function at one, the of the trace of the function at one edge and at the other. Okay, and what we want to do is uh, uh, let this phase depend on time and use that value as the control parameter. Now, of course, this problem, we have an operator that does not depend on time, so the, the operator itself does not depend on time. The time dependence that we are going to build in is encoded in the boundary condition. Uh, now, how are we going to tackle with this? The idea to tackle with this is this uh, unitary transformations that I've written there, this capital T. And if you see, uh, this is a family of unitary transformations that depend itself on the parameter T. And what one can prove is that, not that the Hamiltonian written there is unitary equivalent to the one they wrote below, which is the magnetic Laplacian, but um, the orbits of the Hamiltonian above, um, of the solutions of the Schrodinger equation for the Hamiltonian above, are isomorphic to the orbits of the solutions of the Schrodinger equation with the Hamiltonian below. And the price to pay is, besides including uh, um, the dependence in T in the um, potential vector, one gets some extra time dependence on the potential vector on the right. This comes from the derivative in time of the Schrodinger equation when you consider the unitary transformation. So, this is essentially what happens. So, mathematically, we have an interval with some boundary conditions, but the boundary conditions that we choose give that interval certain topology. So, in this case, it's just the topology of a circle. The equation above is just the full Schrodinger equation when we do the transformation that I was mentioning, this time-dependent unitary transformation. And I like to call this the quantum Faraday law because uh, if you see the extra time that we got because of this unitary transformation is just uh, uh, proportional to the derivative of the potential vector. So it's proportional to the, the derivative of the magnetic field, which is an electric field. So in this setting, doing things as we did, we get a natural way of describing the quantum Faraday law. So you could say, what I mean is not correct just to introduce the time dependence as the potential vector, because then you miss the influence of the electric field. Um, now, for generic quantum graphs, we can do the same. So this simple version that I explained here for this just one interval of this complex phase, we can push that to generic uh, quantum graphs. And we can generalize this family of boundary conditions in several ways, which is what I'm going to introduce in the next slide. So consider that we have some planar graph with V, capital V, is the vertex space, and capital E is the edge space. And to each edge, we are going to associate some Hilbert space, so square integrable functions, on certain length Le. Okay? And now as a Hilbert space for the system, we are going to consider the direct sum on all these Hilbert spaces, and uh, as an operator, the direct sum on, of all the Laplaces that we can build on all these edges. Now, of course, as before, this is simply a bunch of uh, intervals. When does the structure of the graph arise? Well, the structure of the graph arises when one fixes the boundary conditions. And uh, in particular, we are going to select this family of boundary conditions, which we call the quasi-delta boundary conditions. And these are applied edge by edge. So you have a graph with all these connections and uh, on all the vertices. So for each vertex of the graph, I picture there an uh, example of, uh, of just three edges, a vertex with three edges. We are going to impose uh, this n minus one sort of continuity conditions, which are these the quasi-periodic phases, you know. If these parameters C, E, I, V were zero, all of them, this was just the standard continuity conditions that one imposes typically on the vertex. So we are asking for the wave function to be continuous on the graph, except maybe for some jump in the phases of the values. We need to fix n minus one conditions at a vertex where n is the degree of the vertex. And then we are missing one condition to get the self-adjoint, uh, to get a properly well-defined self-adjoint operator. And then what we have to do is to sum over the normal derivatives of the, uh, so the restriction to the boundary of the normal derivatives of the function, including also the phases there, okay? And this is equal to some parameter delta V, 
multiplying the continuous value of the function. Now, in these boundary conditions, if you fix both psi to be zero, all the phases psi to be zero, and the parameter delta to be zero, one gets the usual Kirchhoff Neumann uh, boundary conditions on the graph, okay? If one uh, um, fixes just psi to zero and leads the delta there, what one gets is a point-like interaction of the vertex of the graph. So this family naturally contains all these usual uh, families of boundary conditions built on the graphs. And uh, the good thing is uh, the idea that we did of using this transformation to remove, so what we want to do now is to include time dependency on these parameters, psi and the delta eventually, okay? And the point is, how are we going to deal with this system? Is we can also implement these unitary transformations, time dependent, to transform that system for one Laplacian with quasi-delta boundary conditions into another system for a magnetic Laplacian now this function theta on the right has to do with the derivatives of the potential vectors, but this is not exactly that, so one has to be a bit more careful, but it can be done exactly this way. And the boundary conditions that I showed now become, after this transformation, in these boundary conditions there, which are just continuity of the wave functions on the edges of the graph, plus a condition of the normal derivatives, except that these normal derivatives are now the magnetic normal derivatives. That's why the parameter alpha appears at the phi dot. And we still have this uh, delta-like st strength at the vertex. So one further result that uh, one can show on these graphs is that if all these uh, values of the strength of the parameter delta are bounded, and the magnetic potentials that one gets as a result of the transformation are also bounded, then this family of magnetic Laplacians have uniform lower bounds on one side, and also one can prove that the form domain of this magnetic Laplacian is constant and does not depend on T, right? So even, notice that the operator there, actually the domain is time dependent because it contains the alpha. The dependence on the magnetic potentials is still at the boundary condition. So if the alpha depends on time, these boundary conditions are still time dependent at the level of the operator. What one can prove is that the form domain is going to be constant. And the reason is because when you go to the form domain, the second equation vanishes. This is not a condition that appears at the level of the forms, of uh, the quadratic form associated to these uh, uh, operators. Fine, so let me check if I'm going to have the answers. Well, I guess so. Now, another generalization that we can build on top of this structure is instead of considering just one-dimensional manifolds, so instead of considering intervals, we can consider fatten quantum graphs. So given the structure of a graph, instead of considering that each edge is associated with some interval, we can consider that each edge is associated itself with a Riemannian manifold. And on this Riemannian manifold, we can define exactly the same way, with some extra effort, magnetic Laplacians. And uh, the biggest problem now is how to identify or how to select the appropriate self-ion extension. So what I'm going to tell you, or what we can do is uh, uh, select an analog of these quasi-delta periodic boundary conditions also at the level of these uh, fatnet quantum graphs. And what it is here is just a picture of how we can do that. So now these blue blocks there represent these fatnet edges. So we consider them to be Riemannian manifolds. And what we need to ask is that each of these edges has some boundary, which are this gamma E0, gamma E1, gamma E2, and we need them to be diffeomorphic to each other. So if they're diffeomorphic to each other, in particular they're diffeomorphic to some reference uh, um, manifold, we can implement exactly the same boundary conditions using some unitary equivalence that we can build using that diffeomorphisms. Okay, so in the end we are going to get exactly the same boundary conditions. And what is uh, the best thing is that all that I said before regarding these systems can also be applied in this situation, okay? The notation gets worse, but the results still apply, okay? And also for what is going to come next. So finally, what about the controllability? So remember, we are going to achieve approximate controllability. Uh, so, what are, as I said, there were some results previously regarding controllability on infinite dimensional systems. Uh, unfortunately, they cannot be applied directly to the kinds of problems that we are interested in. Uh, let's say these results work out by these uh, 
people, is, is uh, Busaid, Caponigro, Chambrion, Masson, Sigalotti. They did, uh, 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 well, the results are extremely uh, powerful, I would say, but uh, uh, unfortunately, we cannot apply them. This will be clear in a moment. The main reason is that they built a way in which one can extend the finite dimensional, res the results of finite dimensional control theory to the infinite dimensional case. And for doing that, they have to assume that the controls are piecewise constant, which in the case of linear Hamiltonians that we have and the ones that they consider, assumes that the Hamiltonians are piecewise constant. This means, in particular, that uh, uh, they don't have to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation because they evolve just for, with a constant Hamiltonian. Uh, during a certain time, and then they evolve with a different Hamiltonian. So the problems of the time dependence of the equation is not there. The problem is we cannot use that approach with the time of bodily conditions that we are considering. The, or, uh, or domains will not be fixed at any time. And uh, um, it is clear also why, be, uh, if one reads this uh, theorem of Kisinski in the 60s, giving conditions for the existence of solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So in particular, uh, if your family of Hamiltonians with your controls uh, has a uniform lower bound, so a uniform lower bound that does not depend on the parameter t, and all these operators have the same form domain, and if additionally the quadratic forms, so the function defined by the quadratic forms, okay, let me use the pointer. I did not use the pointer. Okay, just one time. Um, if this function is C2, so it's twice differentiable, then uh, uh, there exists uh, a strongly continuous unitary propagator that solves the Schrodinger equation both in the strong and in the weak sense. And in particular, this propagator maps the domain of the operator at time s into the domain of the operator at time t. So it is very important to have this smoothness of the transformation which will not be there if you consider the piecewise constant Hamiltonians. So if we try to apply this procedure for the piecewise constant case in a situation in which the domains of the operators are not constant, what happens is we can evolve during a certain time with the constant Hamiltonian, but once we have to do the YAMP and apply the next Hamiltonian, our function is not in the proper domain. So we really cannot do that. So we really need something new. And well, this is the result that I was willing to show. In particular, if we consider that u is some three times differentiable function, and we consider that the phases uh, defining the quasi-delta boundary conditions that I define, so the parameter delta is going to be fixed, it's not going to be dependent on time, I'm going just to use the phases, and are like this, so all the phases are going to be proportional to this parameter, then the time-dependent Hamiltonian defined by the Laplacian on the quantum planar graph uh, um, is approximately controllable. Okay, so we managed to prove that. And well, what are the ideas for the proof? Well, we, we relied on the, uh, the result by Chambrion et al. What we needed to do was to use some auxiliary system in which we could apply the result. And then the hardest part was actually to prove that we can have some convergence between these families of uh, uh, auxiliary problems where we can apply Chambron result that converts uh, in an appropriate sense to uh, the problems that we were addressing. So for doing so, we need first to generalize some results on Barry Simon on the existence of solutions of the Schrodinger equation, to one. And we also need to generalize certain uh, convergence results uh, that were uh, developed certain time later. Uh, and so, let me just introduce uh, this uh, convergence result, which we call stability. And besides uh, 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 the fact that this is useful in this business of proving uh, controllability results, uh, I think that this is also a very important uh, result in the business of control itself, because it tells you also, what say? It's the last slide. Uh, it, uh, um, uh, 
if you are not able to apply the controls as you need to apply them, it also tells you what is the error that you are going to commit in the evolution of the system. Okay, so, uh, okay, that's all what I want to say. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and some little advertisement. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I have a question. Um, so to make your talk interesting, uh, why don't you take alpha complex? Uh, well, <laughs> because uh, 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 the satellite could be done is... Uh, uh, <laughs> I could. I, I, I think also uh, the problem is, uh, I don't know if the, 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 the solutions of the Schrodinger equation are going to exist in, in this case anymore. I mean, the, the, Hermitian, the hermicity of the operator is, is used heavily in the proof. I mean, you could do that, then you have to control what are the resolvents of your operators. Because Kisinski's theorem is way more general than I presented, so it could be done. I didn't do that uh, because this is already very hard, <laughs> the self adjoint case, so I, uh, and uh, we didn't solve it yet. So maybe if we solve completely the problem, we will be able to do that. Uh, uh, Kisinski's theorem about the existence can be applied. This can be applied because uh, the essential requirement that he needs to prove the theorem is that there exists in the resolvent set of the operators, some uh, uh, common space where they can, uh, uh, so they need uh, some uh, non-empty resolvent set in the domains of the Hamiltonians to define some maps that allow them to prove uh, the approximation that he needs to prove the time uh, dependence of the equation. So it could be done if we consider this alpha complex. Good, so we shall discuss it. Yes. <laughs> Any other question, remark? Okay, so then uh, let's conclude uh, this uh, morning session. Oh.